Thank you all for having me. And uh, this is, it's really a pleasure to be here. And I want to spend just a couple minutes before I take your questions, because as I talk, you're probably going to have even more questions. But I want to just introduce what my agency does and who we are and what our primary responsibilities are. So the, the first question, which I sort of half jokingly threw out is, is the Chicago Board of Ethics an oxymoron? If that's the case, then I'm a philosophical conundrum because I'm standing here as a carbon-based life form. I've been with the agency sub since September of 1993. So, so I'm on my 26th, my, almost at the end of my 26th year. And uh, before that, I practiced law for nine years here in the city. And um, so I'm a lawyer by training. I think I'm the third lawyer in the room. I also have a master's degree in ethics from the University of Chicago Divinity School, which doesn't really play that much into my day-to-day -day job but it's a nice philosophical uh, background and it's a nice credential to have. But my agency has been around in one form or other since Harold Washington was the mayor in 1986. When he was the mayor, there was an executive order board that was formed, which means it was not part of the law. And the mayor can issue executive orders, which covers only the executive branch. So there was an executive order bo uh, board that was enacted. It had what lawyers called a sunset provision, which meant that it expired after one year. During that one year, believe it or not, the city council and Mayor Washington and his administration actually negotiated and hammered out the first version of the city's governmental ethics ordinance. So we at the city of Chicago are one of uh, a number of large city ethics agencies. Uh, the New York City uh, Conflicts of Interest Board does something similar to what we do. San Francisco, Los Angeles, Atlanta, Philadelphia, they all have boards of ethics or ethics commissions. We all have basically similar responsibilities, although there are three basic areas that all of us deal with, and in some cities that's spread out through different agencies. There's ethics, there's campaign financing regulations, and then there is lobbying regulation, the third of which I want to spend a little bit of time on tonight because it's very data uh, laden. But since uh, the ordinance was first enacted, which was in February of 1987, our law has been amended 33 times. So I think that's probably, in the, in the entire city's municipal code, that's probably a more frequent amendment schedule than almost any other part with the exception of the building code and the zoning code. And, um, but what we do, as I say, is really very similar to what our colleagues in other cities do. Uh, we're small, we have a full-time staff of just eight people, four of us are lawyers, four of us are staff. We also have a board that's composed of seven members, all of whom are appointed by the mayor and confirmed by the city council and they, they're volunteers, uh, we get paid. Uh, not enough, but we get paid. And um, in any case, uh, what we do is four basic responsibilities. The first and the most important responsibility that we have, at least from my standpoint as a long-term staff member, is as an advisory agency. Put plainly, we help people stay out of trouble, but we can do that only if they contact us. And we give what we call advisory opinions, which means that every time a city employee or a city official or a representative of a city contractor, a vendor who's doing work, for example, with the Department of Innovation and Technology, I've got some colleagues here that I want to give a shout out to from Do It. Uh, they have lots of vendors in the IT world. Uh, those people who work for those companies are subject to the ethics ordinance. The city has about 650 or so appointed officials people who serve on boards and commissions, for example, the Plan Commission, the Zoning Board of Appeals, et cetera. They're all appointed by the mayor and confirmed by the city council, as is my position. They're all subject to the governmental ethics ordinance, as are approximately 32,000 or so city employees. Well, we do not have jurisdiction and we do not cover the Chicago Public Schools, the Chicago Transit Authority, the Chicago Park District the Metropolitan Pier and Exposition Authority. As a matter of state law, those agencies are actually different from the city of Chicago. And uh, they have their own ethics officers. They're not law uh, forming agencies, so they don't have a law, but they have ethics policies. And all of us have ethics officers and all the ethics officers meet on a quarterly basis because we're all facing similar issues. But our primary work, our bread and butter work is advice and guidance. When I first started with the agency, we were getting about 600 telephone calls and walk-in inquiries a year. It was before the days of widely distributed email, back in the early 90s. In, a, in an average year now, we get about 4,900 of these. And the vast majority of them come from city employees and city officials asking us questions like, can I have this outside job? Can I attend this event that's gonna be paid by a vendor? 
can I fly out to Los Angeles to give a speech on my particular specialty, which is you know, municipal bond finance or whatever it is? Uh, I've got a sister who works in my department. Is that going to be a problem? I'm leaving my job with the city to take a job in the private sector. Are there any responsibilities, obligations, prohibitions that I'm subject to? That's the kind of thing that we deal with on a daily basis. And our job really is to keep people out of trouble. But we can do that if and only if they pick up the phone and they call us, or they send us an email, or they walk into our office. And really, that is what we are here to do, is to help people stay out of trouble. All of the advisory opinions that we give are considered confidential by law. And that means that the fact that somebody called us, whether it's the mayor, or it's an alderman, or it's a rank and file police officer, it really makes no difference. The fact that they contacted us, the nature of their question, and the nature of our answer, those are all confidential. We report on statistics, and we report on general topics, and we use scenarios that we get for educational purposes, but the names of the people who've contacted us, uh, what we've advised, that's all considered to be confidential. And the worst thing that we can say in advance is no, you can't do it. And we encourage people to call us because if they lay their cards on the table, essentially we're ethical ombuds people. That's, that's basically what we do. They give us the facts, and if they're, if they're telling us about something that they're thinking of doing, the worst thing we can say in advance is no, don't do it. Now, if somebody comes to us and they give us the facts that constitute kind of the proverbial smoking gun, hey, I own this company on the side and my company entered into the subcontract with the city's Department of Transportation. Am I in trouble? Well, we have to ask a few more questions. If it, and if it turns out that yes, it appears to have been a past violation of the law, then we have a slightly different procedure that, that, we, that we are uh, required to follow, which is that at the next board meeting, and our board meets approximately once a month, we present the facts. The legal staff presents the facts to the board, and the board then has to decide, was there in fact, on the facts that we have, the appearance of a past violation? If the answer is yes, the next question is, was that violation minor or technical in nature? And an example of a technical violation would be, there's a $50 gift limitation that city officials and city employees are subject to. If somebody accepts a $55 gift, we're, we're not gonna go after them for a fine, okay? They're gonna get a confidential letter of admonition saying, hey, you accepted a $55 gift, don't do it again. We keep records of that, and if they repeat that kind of a violation, then it's no longer a minor violation. That doesn't happen very often that we get people calling us with past conduct that constitutes a violation. On the other hand, if the board believes that there appears to be a violation that was not minor, it was a serious conflict of interest, it was a serious, uh, somebody signed off on a contract that involved somebody that they were negotiating future employment with, then what we do is we tell the person as a legal matter, we have to tell the person that they may report themselves to the city's inspector general, which conducts investigations. And if they don't make the report to the IG's office within two weeks, or 14 days, as lawyers like to say, then we have to make the report on their behalf. Once it's in the hands of the inspector general, then it's subject to the inspector general's own rules. The IG can investigate. Uh, the IG cannot investigate. It's completely up to that agency. Whenever the inspector general does conduct an ethics investigation, at the end of their investigation, if that office believes that there have been one or more violations of the ethics law, then they turn the case over to us. And I assign one of my lawyers to look at the entire record, which is the written report, as well as the supporting evidence. Uh, it'll be documents, it'll be interview transcripts, et cetera. And then we have to figure out whether there was probable cause, whether there's probable cause to believe that somebody may have violated the law. As a legal matter, that's a pretty low bar. What we're saying is would a reasonable person looking at the facts that were adduced in the IG's investigation conclude that there might have been a violation of the ethics law? Now, I will be honest, we've thrown out cases in, in the past because there was no probable cause, which is a shame. But most of the time, there is probable cause and then we call the per we we're, we're required to invite the person in. They don't have to take, up, take us up on this, but they can come in and they can bring a lawyer with them and they can meet with the board one-on-one -on -one and they can try to convince the board's name. Hey board, I wasn't asked about this, or hey board, here's why I believe I didn't violate the law. If they change the board's mind, the case is over. 
it's dismissed, it remains confidential because we don't want to besmirch somebody's reputation if in fact they didn't violate the law. On the other hand, if they cannot change the board's mind, then the board can either enter into a settlement agreement and the penalties for violating the ethics law, you may have seen this over the past month and a half, we were sort of unfortunately made fun of by the press, but for most violations, the maximum penalty is $2,000, okay? It's not a huge hit, and we're trying to get those penalties upped because we're behind our big city peers. In New York City, for example, they can impose fines up to $30,000 for a violation, and that stings. $2,000 stings for most people, but for some people it doesn't really sting. But more importantly, it kind of sends the message that ethics violations are like traffic violations, they're sort of misdemeanors, and that's not the right message. But in any case, we can settle. All of our settlement, ag settlement agreements become public. They're all on our website. Or the person can have his or her day in court, which basically means that they can go to an administrative hearing in front of a, an administrative law judge that's a private practitioner that's hired by the city. And that's happened once. We had an alderman who went to an ethics trial. It was uh, two years. It took, in, I don't know how many thousands of dollars in legal fees. But we ended up finding, the, finding that the alderman was in violation for failing to keep timesheets for his staff. We ended up fining him $5,000 because it was multitude of violations. And we would have settled the case with him much earlier for a lower amount, but that's the breaks of the legal system. So enforcement is an important part of what we do, but it's, it ties in with our basic philosophy, which is that it's better to have people call us in advance and help them to avoid trouble rather than have them get into trouble by not calling us. The third function that we have is education. Education is, is actually the biggest part of our budget. Uh, all city officials and city employees are required to take an annual ethics training course, uh, which we do online, and empirical studies have shown that you can't really make it much longer than about 30 minutes, because otherwise people fall asleep. And in the past, we've tried to make it funny, um, but one of the things that we are now tasked with doing is adjudicating sexual harassment complaints with respect to the city's 53 elected officials. Can't make that funny. So we've sort of given up on the idea of making the rest of the ethics training funny. Uh, but still, we have good results with it. Because the purpose of ethics training is not to create 30, 33,000 ethics experts. It's to get their antennae up so that they know, hey, this could be a problem. Either I shouldn't do it, or better, if I think there's a potential problem, I should pick up the phone and I should call the Board of Ethics for advice. The last basic function that we have is regulation, which in our world means public disclosures, and this is where the data comes in. So the city requires public disclosure of certain types of things. Number one is uh, we have about 3,800 city officials and city employees, which is about 15% of the city's workforce that files an annual ethics disclosure form. We call it a statement of financial interests. It's a form that asks high-ranking city people, people that have responsibility for dealing with contractors, letting contracts, supervising contracts, doing inspections on businesses, et cetera, what are your sources of outside income? Do you have an outside job? Do you own property in the city besides your home? Do you um, have an ownership interest in a business that conducts business in the city? Does your spouse or does your domestic partner work for a company that does business with the city? Those, those, those questions are kind of standard in the ethics world. They, people can file those online. We have those posted on our website where they live for seven years. After seven years, we have permission from the state archivist at the Secretary of State's office to destroy them. But for that seven years, they are open for public inspection. And you probably have all heard the, the saying that's attributed to uh, Louis Brandeis, who was on the Supreme Court, sunshine is said to be the best of disinfectants. So in fact, by making these disclosures public, people out there in the community, which is where the community comes in, if they think that somebody is being untruthful on one of their answers, hell, they should file a complaint. If they file a complaint, that complaint will be investigated. And if lo and behold, somebody knowingly withheld information on their annual statement of financial interest, which has happened, then they get fined and they get named and shamed because that's not an acceptable violation. So we also have to chase late filers, which is really a pain. Uh, it's not worth it, but we have to do it. The other kind of disclosures that we have is lobbying. Now, almost every jurisdiction in the United States regulates lobbying. We in Chicago happen to have a pretty broad definition of what a lobbyist is. 
A lobbyist is basically, and it's a, it's a dirty word in American politics. You will, you will find nobody in the United States with a business card that says, I am a lobbyist. Nobody, nobody likes to think of themselves as a lobbyist. Because immediately, probably, I, I would bet, what's the first word you think of when you hear the word lobbyist, or the first two words? Special interests, you know? Yeah, okay. Nobody wants to be associated with that. But in fact, it's a constitutional right under the First Amendment. And from a regulator standpoint, i.e. my standpoint, the more lobbying, the better. It's just that it's regulated speech, meaning that everybody who engages in lobbying as defined by, by Chicago law, which is everybody who represents either an employer or a client, to try to meet with or contact city officials or city employees to influence their judgments, those people have to register with us uh, as a lobbyist. And registration means filling out an online form, which can be done by most people in three minutes or less, and then four times a year disclosing their activity. What campaign contributions did they make and to whom? Uh, what compensation did they receive? What expenditures did they make? What departments in the city did they lobby? Who were their clients? What matters were they lobbying on? There's a lot of lobbying that goes on, for example, out at the airport. There's a lot of lobbying that goes on with the police department because the police department buys lots of equipment and buys lots of computer software, et cetera. Lots of lobbying that goes on and do it. Um, every department except the Board of Ethics has <laughs> lobbyists. Yeah, nobody seems to want to lobby us. That's okay, that's just fine. But what we do is we collect all of this data, and this is, this, is like, this is where you guys come in. This is gobs of raw data that my staff and I are, in a sense, overwhelmed by, and we're not really competent to put all this together in terms of apps. So we would love it if people from your community would take a look at our data and be able to say, you know, make it user-friendly so that somebody can say, who were the, who were the top 10 companies that, that spent the most on lobbying in the past three months, in the past six months, in the past two years? What industries are there? Does the real estate industry outspend the aviation industry? Does the outdoor advertising industry, which is very heavily regulated and, and very, they, they have lots of lobbyists, do they, spend, do they outspend the um, utilities industry, for example, the, you know, the gas and electric companies? All of these companies have, um, have lobbyists. And again, from my perspective, there's nothing wrong with lobbying. It's a perfectly legal right. It's just that it's regulated speech. And by the way, I will say that we collect about 45% of our operating budget through lobbying fees, which is a very nice thing. So that's kind of an overview of what we do. Uh, the law itself, as you would imagine, is, is sort of a basic conflicts of interest law. Um, it needs to be beefed up in terms of its penalties, but it covers things like nepotism. So for example, if city officials or city employees are related to each other, and there's a definition of relative, um, they cannot supervise each other. But relatives can work in different chains of command within a certain city department. So for example, in the police department, in, this, in the city's department of water management, you know, you've got brothers and sisters and, and, and you know, mothers and sons and, and fathers and uncles and nieces. It's not a problem as long as they're not in the same chain of command and as long as one of them is not exercising supervisory authority over, over another one. Another way that the nepotism law applies is that you cannot manage contracts with companies that employ any of your relatives. It doesn't mean that your relatives' companies can't have contracts with the city. It just means that you can't act on those contracts. You can't be involved. The technical term is you have to recuse yourself from those contracts. We cover political activity. Uh, not surprisingly, a lot of city officials and city employees are politically active. I'm actually prohibited from being politically active, which is a nice thing, um, because I don't have to go to political fundraisers, et cetera. But other city employees are not so prohibited, and they can be politically active, they can make political contributions, but they can't do it with or on city property. So we've had cases where people have been caught using their city smartphone or their, uh, their laptop to uh, record political contributions. Uh-uh, no, no, you could lose your job over that. You can do that, but you have to do it on your own time and with your own equipment. And you can't solicit or collect political contributions from persons over whom you have contract authority in your city job, sort of basic. Pretty much every jurisdiction has prohibitions like that. We have gift prohibitions. I mentioned before that there's a $50 gift limitation from any single source. So for example, I as a city employee cannot accept 
gifts worth more than $50 in a calendar year from any of you. The exceptions would be if you're one of my family members or if you're a personal friend, then I can accept anything from you. Um, I may have to report that gift on my annual ethics form, but I, I'm not prohibited from accepting it. Business travel is typically allowed as long as the expenses are reasonable and they're reasonably related to the person's city job. So if my colleagues in Do It fly out to San Francisco to uh, speak at a user conference for one of the big software companies and um, they're gonna come back with useful information, et cetera, it's gonna be fine as long as they clear it with my office in advance, as long as the expenses are reasonable, so reasonable air, reasonable logic, reasonable hotel, and then within 10 days of them returning, they have to report it. Let me, uh, let me hold, hold questions, because you probably have a lot of questions. And we make all these disclosures public as well. So there's a lot of information that we have on our website that we share through open data. Um, frankly, to me, it's kind of overwhelming. But it's there, and um, we encourage people to be active users of our information, because if they sense that something is wrong, you can tell that with an eight-person staff, we don't have the eyes and ears to be everywhere, but we want to hear about complaints. Uh, we don't have the authority to investigate complaints, but under our current chair, Bill Conlon, who's a former federal prosecutor, he's now a retired partner at one of the big law firms, very smart, very aggressive guy, and he asked me a couple years ago, you may remember when the Cubs went to the World Series, well, of course you remember when the Cubs went to the World Series, but from my standpoint as, as an ethics dude, I remember that particularly because we, entered, we, we issued an opinion saying aldermen can no longer buy tickets at face value when the rest of us would have to pay $450 for the worst seat in Wrigley Field. You'd have to pay thousands of dollars for a really good seat. Well, the aldermen weren't so happy with us. But Bill decided at that point, if we don't need a factual investigation from the Inspector General, in other words, if there are facts out there in the public record that to us show that there was an apparent violation, then we're just gonna make a finding of probable cause and we're gonna start our own enforcement actions. And we've done that on about 49 different occasions in the past couple of years. So you may remember a couple of years ago when Mayor Emanuel's emails were released to the Tribune pursuant to a lawsuit by the Tribune. We scoured every single one of those emails, 3,200 pages of emails. We were looking for unregistered lobbying, and by golly, we found it. And the fees, the fines for unregistered lobbying are gargantuan, as opposed to $2,000 for a conflicts of interest violation. The fines are $1,000 per day from the day five after you first engaged in lobbying until you register. Doesn't matter how many acts of lobbying you had in between. So we ended up finding a major company, which had its name mentioned earlier, and one of its top lobbyists, $92,000, which I think is the largest fine in North American regulatory history for lobbying. So we're you know, perversely proud of that. <laughs> so <laughs> the money, by the way, doesn't go into our pizza fund. It goes into the city's general coffers. That's fine. Uh, so my job is ever fascinating, and I've seen lots of different changes, but lots of things that remain the same. So are we an oxymoron? The best answer I can give is, look, if people take the time to call my office, then we will keep them on the straight and narrow. And they, if they give us the facts and they follow our advice, the worst thing that we can say in advance is, no, you can't do it. Now, one other comment about our advisory opinions, in addition to them being confidential, we do make our formal opinions public on our website, but it, it's standard practice in the ethics industry to take names out. So we have names that are, um, in the old days, we would substitute fictitious names. But now we have better software, and we just, you know, we just, we just put a, a large line through names. But the opinions are there for people to try to figure out the legal principles that are involved. Um, but the only people that have the authority to, or the only people that we have the authority to grant opinions to are people that are covered by the law. So it's city employees, city officials, former city employees, former officials, or their attorneys or their representatives, vendors or lobbyists. A member of the public, they can call and they can say, hey, did Alderman so-and-so violate the law? I read this article. We, can't, we don't have authority to answer that because the only way that a person in that position would have the authority to get an opinion from us is if they were personally involved in the situation. So it's one of the reasons why the press doesn't particularly like us, because they would love to get us on record as saying, oh yeah, so-and-so violated the law, then they have a story. At the same time, I've learned the hard way 
that I can't even say, hey, that's a possible violation. Why? Because the next day the headline will be Executive Director of Board of Ethics says Alderman so-and-so may have violated the ethics law. And that's happened. I got burned that way. Not the, it's not the best way to run a, rail, a railroad, but that's, that's my life. So, um, you know, in other words, it's really only the Board of Ethics, after hearing all the evidence, that can make a finding, an official determination that somebody violated the ethics law. Uh, the penalties are fines. Uh, somebody, in theory, could be terminated. But the only people that have ever been terminated for violations of ethics laws are people that came to the board, received advice, and then basically blew the board off and disregarded the board's advice. So if a complaint comes back to us and it turns out that they asked us for advice in the past and they ignored it, eh, the board's going to recommend termination. There's really no tolerance for that. Uh, but that's, that's exceedingly rare. So, all right, I babble long enough. Now it's time to turn it over for your questions. So you've got a question here. Um, sorry to ask you two questions. One is, how do you measure how effective you've been since 96? Because I know that's kind of a hard thing to do. Um, and a, uh, a nice one important question is, you said you can't accept more than $50 from any of you. Or are you talking about residents of Chicago? Yeah. Well, I'll take the second question first. The second question is, the basic gift law is that we as city officials or city employees are limited to $50 per source per year, unless it's a personal friend, in which case there's no limit, or it's a family member, in which case there's no limit, or if it's legitimate business travel, which is really not a gift. So the first question about how do we measure effectiveness? This, we are members, in fact, I'm the incoming president of our professional association, the Council on Government Ethics Laws. It's all the state ethics commissions, about nine branches of the federal government, the Canadian provinces, the Canadian big cities, all the big cities and the, and the states and many counties, including Cook County. It's a perennial topic. How do we measure our effectiveness? There's really no foolproof way to do it, but we keep very careful statistics on the numbers of advisory opinions that we, that we get. And we know that as soon as people take, departments complete training, in other words, all their people complete training, the number of advisory opinions and requests that we get from that department go up. So training is a critical part. Probably the best, the best combination of ways that we can measure effectiveness are um, numbers of advisory opinions that we give out every year. And the relatively, I would not say relatively, I would say the absolutely small number of ethics investigations that have been conducted by the Inspector General's office. Now, I should also mention, I know you've all, you all read the paper. You know what happened today in federal court. We are not a criminal agency, OK? So if our law has always said that if during the course of our work we have a reasonable belief that there has been a crime that has occurred, either a state crime or a federal crime, we are required to suspend our work, boom, suspend it, and refer it to the appropriate criminal authority, which in several cases has been the United States Attorney's Office. In some cases, it's been the Cook County State's Attorney's Office. It just depends on the nature of the crime. So we are not a criminal agency. So, you know, I get a little irked when sometimes the press will say, where's the Board of Ethics been, even as, you know, depending on what time frame you're looking at, 30, 32, 33, 35, aldermen have gone to federal prison. Well, they're going to federal prison because of extortion and tax evasion. This is outside of the purview of the city's Board of Ethics. Can you be involved in political activity in a park, for instance, city property? Because it's city property. Or does that not count since the park's district isn't under the Board of Ethics? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I can only, yes, the short answer is because of the First Amendment, you can be involved. Uh, you may have to get a permit if you're going to have a political, I don't know the, the, the rules. I can talk to my colleague, Judge Mike Stutley of the Park District, but I can, I can speak to City Hall, for example. And political activity occurs in City Hall. For example, during the mayoral and the aldermanic races, a lot of candidates had political rallies in City Hall. But there are two cardinal rules that, that can't be broken. Number one is you can't use the city seal, the official city seal, which is that little dude right there. And at one point, I knew what all those little symbols meant. Uh, I've forgotten. <laughs> it's evanescent knowledge. Um, and number two is that you cannot, under any circumstances, accept or solicit political contributions while you're on city property. But beyond that, it's public property. So, you know, the, the First Amendment applies, and political speech is, is speech, and it's protected speech. 
but, this, but the state, loosely speaking, the government, can impose certain restrictions, such as you can't use you know, certain types of city property, because then it gives the public the impression that it's an official city event or that the city sponsors the candidate or approves of the candidate. Not a good message. Um, and money. Money cannot change hands um, for political contribution purposes on or with city property. Registering as a, a lobbyist seems obviously like a very helpful way to correctly do business with the city. Uh, if one is registered as a lobbyist, are there any activities that you might do as just a public citizen that, when done as a lobbyist, become something you need to watch more carefully? That's a really good question. The short answer is generally not, because um, if you're if you're representing yourself as a taxpayer or you're representing yourself as a resident, that's not lobbying. You have to be representing somebody else. And Chicago's law is different from most others because our law does not require that you be compensated for it or that you spend money. It used to up until the year 2000. And then the, that was when uh, the Daly administration was in. They got rid of the compensation uh, or expenditure threshold. So uh, we and the state of New Mexico and now the city of Boston are the only jurisdictions in the United States that don't have a compensation threshold. But the key is you have to be acting on somebody else's behalf and you actually have to be seeking city action or you have to be seeking to influence the judgments of city people. So if you're just standing out there uh, you know, in um, Washington Square Park or uh, Bug House Square you know, where the Newberry Library is, uh, I say that because once a year they, have, they, they act like Hyde Park and they have speakers. You can say whatever you want. As long as you're representing yourself, you are not lobbying. But if, let's say, there was an alderman there and you were being paid by XYZ Corporation and you were saying, hey, alderman, what about, you know, I'm a, I, I really want you to vote in favor of that bill that will benefit my employer, XYZ Corporation. That would be lobbying. You mentioned that you would like the civic tech community to organize lobbyist spending data and make it more useful. Where can that data be found? It's found on the city's data portal. And the, the people who can answer that are sitting right there. They can help you. Um, I, 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 so John is, John is, is, John is, the, he is, he is the, he is the Zen master of city data. So all of our data that we collect through these electronic lobbying forms, and lobbyists have to file with us electronically. All that data is then sorted, and it goes into the Socrata database. Now, I have to tell you that I'm, I'm not a numbers dude. That's why I went to law school. I'm not a data dude. Um, but I know it's there. And it's just waiting. It's waiting to be sorted by people that have the time and the inclination to do it. So, but that's where you would find it, is on the city's data portal. Um, I'm just curious if, uh, there's, if you have an intuition that there's something in the data that would be uh, uh -huh. bad. If, uh, I don't think you're going to find out anything really ground-swellingly fascinating, but it would be interesting to know, for example, like which you could qu if you're if you're if you're an economist, for example, you're into data economics, you could probably correlate lobbying spending with um, with segments of the economy, sectors of the economy. For example, if we're in a good economy, um, you know, certain elastic businesses, real estate. This is the prime example, the most visible, aside from aviation, business in Chicago. Um, I would love to see a correlation between uh, certain economic predictors and real estate development and, and lobbying, hiring by real estate professionals and real estate developers in the city. So it's, it's not, okay, you know, basic disclaimer, all this, we're in the world of geekiness anyway, okay? This is all geeky stuff. But I think it's actually quite fascinating from my perspective, having been in this, in this business so long, to see how lobbying spending is sort of a lagging indicator of how sectors in the economy are doing. Yeah, so I served with the mayor's office for people with disability. Mm -hmm. And usually what we dealt with were like, this sidewalk isn't this big enough, or could you move the bus stop here or there? And it was otherwise transparent. We didn't know who was asking it or why they were asking it other than there was something that was wrong with it that made it inaccessible. Now, when you talk about the lobbying stuff and correlating it with it, uh, that really bothers me because if you have come in and say I'm, XYZ, I'm representing XYZ Corporation, then the alderman, or I can also say the congressman, know that that company is going to do is trying to develop their business and actually you can look at there is data out there looking at congressmen and their wives and their brothers and all and things like that 
and how, how rich they become after their office because they realize when those businessmen, businesses come in to lobby something that there's benefit going to be happening. And that's also a way for the, uh, the aldermen or congressmen or whatever to gain largesse from those companies indirectly, let's say. Would there be a way to, to change that so lobbyists can not say, I represent this company or something like that? Or no, the only way to, it's a really interesting observation that you make. I don't know if everybody heard that, but the point basically is that once you know who the lobbyists are, then it creates a temptation for lawmakers and policymakers to, in a sense, court who those lobbyists are so that when they leave government, they can sort of feather their own nest and yeah, take a yeah, job with them. Or invest in those companies. Or invest in those companies. Yeah. The, the, only, the only answer to that is, is, is that lobbying, the public in a sense, the, not in a sense, the public in a very real sense has a right to know who is being paid to influence their lawmakers or their, you know, their government officials' judgments. Now, the flip side of that is that the, the lawmakers and the government officials then know who, in a sense, the power brokers are. But that's why we have post-employment restrictions. So one of the things that, that the city's governmental ethics ordinance has is that when people leave the city, either through retirement or they just resign or whatever, it doesn't really matter how they leave, even if they're terminated involuntarily, they are all subject to post-employment restrictions. Now, the restrictions don't prohibit a city person from working for a particular company. Other laws may, but Chicago's doesn't. What Chicago's law does is that it says for a certain period of time, in most cases it's one year, you've got a freeze period where you can't work on business transactions that involve city government if you were involved in that type of transaction while you were in city service. So, um, you know, you're correct. I mean, the more information you make public, then in a sense, you can look at it and say, well, then people, it increases the temptation that people have to do ill. But the only way to counteract it is by having different laws that address that, uh, that secondary problem. It's the best answer I can give. Pivoting off something you said, what degree of discretion does the Board of Ethics have in deciding whether and at what level of severity to punish violations, and to what degree are the punishments mandatory under the ethics ordinance? Good question. Uh, the board does have discretion, although for most violations, it's not a wide discretion. Our chair and I would like to see much wider discretion. Right now, the range is if somebody's found in violation for most violations is between $500 and $2,000 for each violation. So uh, the board has discretion within that range. Now, we'd like to see it move to either $5,000 or $10,000 or last week when we proposed our formal uh, change our formal suggested changes, we would like to see it ra get raised from $500 to $20,000, which would give the board a wide swath of discretion. Um, so the board, uh, once the board decides that there has been a violation, then it has, within that framework, it has discretion to find at the high level or the low level. Um, but how the board decides that is, by the time we've gotten that far, we've heard from the subject of the investigation, we've heard from the subject's attorneys, we've heard from the inspector general, we've heard both sides of the story. And that's one of the reasons why we have a seven member board, uh, only, only a few of whom are lawyers. So they hear all the evidence and it's really up to them to decide what level to find. So. All right, thank you so much. Everyone please give a warm thank you applause. Do you have to tell us? Please ask your questions.